I think I've got the easiest sounding title here, but then I fill it with a lot of tongue twisters to make it interesting. So my presentation deals with signal to noise ratios in micro XRF analysis of glass samples. And these uh, are useful for several aspects, including the, it uh, helps to answer the question, when is a peak a peak? This topic got started at an elemental analysis working group discussion where the XRF users broke off and we were talking about some of the issues that we face, including what do we do with some, some of the small peaks that we run across in glass cases? Um, I put arrows on several of these down here and we were discussing, would you call that one a peak? Would you use that in element ratio when you're comparing glass samples? We recognized there was a need for standardization to make those decisions. And after, during that discussion, we brought up the topic of the possibility of signal to noise ratios to help those assessments. And after that discussion, we decided to explore the signal to noise ratios further and see where that led. And that actually led into more than just, is it a peak and should we use it in ratios? And that's what I'll be sharing today. It's divided into three sections. I've got some definitions of terms. The reasons why you may want to calculate signal to noise ratios when you're doing XRF on glass and also how to calculate those signal to noise ratios. Just a quick word of warning before we get going so you know what to expect. Uh, statisticians, don't worry, you'll, you'll be fine here. All right, the first definition, first term is signal to noise ratio. And when you're doing this, signal is, uh, you're trying to measure how much analyte is present. The noise is anything that interferes with that measurement of the signal, random fluctuations from the environment or uh, from the instrument. Signal is oftentimes defined as the peak area. That's how you calculate that. The noise in most typical applications is the standard deviation of the baseline when the analyte is absent. And the signal to noise ratio is simply signal divided by noise. This doesn't, however, work for XRF analysis uh, because you're not able to take out the glass sample or take out the strontium out of this example um, to get what the noise would be, what the standard deviation of the baseline would be because the background is dependent on the matrix. So we need a way to calculate signal and noise on the same spectrum, and people have done that. Uh, signal to noise ratio for XRF is just a little bit different then. The signal is still the peak area, the area in green, and the noise then is not true noise, but it's the square root of the background counts under the peak of interest. SNR is signal divided by this noise, and like I said, this has been around for a while. It's 1975 IUPAC nomenclature rules. So it's an application of what's already been out there. Next definition, limit of detection, or LOD. The LOD is the lowest concentration of an analyte that can be reliably detected. It corresponds to a signal to noise ratio for a peak of three. And at three, a peak doesn't look very good. Um, there's about a 90% confidence level that that analyte is actually present. Um, but there's enough information there that uh, you're able to say there is a peak. This was taken from the 1975 rules and also supported by a 1980 ACS paper in analy analytical chemistry. Limit of quantitation. So now you've, you have a peak there. Um, you've got it detected, but now you want to uh, be able to quantitate it. And the LOQ is the lowest concentration of that analyte that could be reliably quantified. It corresponds to a signal to noise ratio of 10 for a peak. And this is from that same 1980 paper. So now I get into the reasons why you would calculate signal to noise ratios when you're doing XRF analysis of glass. Question that comes up, when is a peak a peak? And if we apply those rules, the 1975 rules, uh, you can label a peak anytime the signal to noise ratio of that peak is at least three. A caveat uh, includes interferences, and these can be, like Christine mentioned earlier, you assess your spectrum to find out what's going on, and you can get interferences from other elements, some peaks, escape peaks, system peaks. Here's an example of a glass case. I think this was the second case I ran after we modified our procedures to uh, use this, and I had, I'll expand to this region, I had some elements some possible peaks that I wasn't comfortable necessarily just labeling right out. The titanium looked like it was there, but it didn't look very good. Copper and zinc kind of looked okay, but 
not anything I would just jump out and, uh, and label right away. Strontium and zirconium I just uh, circled for comparison here. Calculated the signal to noise ratios for these peaks and titanium was six, copper and zinc were in the five range. And so all three of these can be labeled on your spectrum. Okay, now you have it labeled and you want to know should I use it in a ratio. This helps you to, to select the elements for ratio comparisons and to apply the 1980 American Chemical Society guidelines because we want to use reliably quantified uh, values. Any peak with a signal to noise ratio of at least 10 can be used in these element ratios for doing semi-quantitative comparisons with the same caveats. This one was the first case I performed after we changed our procedures to look at, look at it this way. And I had several, several peaks that looked pretty decent, but they seemed not very strong. I wasn't sure if I should use those for comparisons, for semi-quant comparisons. I didn't know if I should do manganese iron as an example, or rubidium iron, or strontium zirconium. So I calculated the signal to noise ratios for each of these. And for every one of them, the signal to noise ratio was at least 10. So I was able to use all of those in ratios. And there you can get a sense for what the peaks look like at that LOQ value. How low can you go? What are the limits of detection for your instrument uh, using your method? What you do is you estimate the lim limits of detection from standard glasses. These standard glasses are standard reference material like 1831. Um, it can be FGS, the German uh, standard glasses that have known concentrations or reported concentrations of several different elements in that glass sample. And to, to find out the LOD, you use this uh, equation, three times the reported concentration of that element in that standard divided by the signal to noise ratio of that element's peak. And I'll show you what that looks like on a spectrum. Here I have SRM 1831 with a reported titanium concentration of 114 parts per million. And if you see the titanium peak right there, it has a signal to noise ratio of 7.1. So I plug those into the equation and I come out with an LOD of titanium using this instrument and this method for, of 48 parts per million. Compare that to zirconium as another example and I got a limit of detection um, of 5.9 parts per million. So you can see it's not equal from one place to another, one element to another across the spectrum. This next slide shows how much they actually vary. Uh, this is a table showing average limits of detection calculated from three different glass standards run on my instrument. Um, it's a 100 micron monocap system for 1200 live seconds. And you see it ranges from 7,000 at sodium down all the way to single digits for strontium zirconium. The primary factor for this improvement involves the critical escape depth of the emitted x-rays from these elements. In other words, how far through the glass can those emitted x-rays travel and still make it to the detector? Um, and the critical escape depth for sodium is just six microns whereas for strontium, it's up over 2,000 microns. So you're sampling a much uh, greater depth uh, for the heavier elements. And if you compare these to other published values that show LODs for XRF, these are greatly improved because the standard method is you analyze thin films at 100 live seconds. And instead, this is doing it on casework type examples, and this is full thickness. Hopefully, most of the time you get full thickness samples. Um, but even if it doesn't, you, you do get uh, improved compared to uh, the other standard methods. The next thing you can do once you have the signal to noise ratios is compare XRF systems. This can be for purchasing reasons, it can be for troubleshooting, um, it can be to um, improve your methodology. And what you do is you run the standard glass samples, calculate your LODs, and you compare them from one system to another. This slide shows uh, a comparison of three different configurations. This is collecting um, from standard reference material 1831 for 1200 live seconds. The first is a 100 micron monocap system. The middle one's a polycap. 
and the third one's a 300 micron monocap. And you can see that they all follow the same general trend of uh, the LODs going from thousands down to single digits, but they do differ from one system to another. And if you notice the titanium and strontium are highlighted, those all show the comparison on the actual spectra in the next few slides. Here are unnormalized spectra from those three systems, uh, 1831 for 1200 live seconds. You can see that the polycap has a lot more signal than the other two, and the monocap of 100 micron um, has significantly less. If we expand to this region, you see the same increased intensity, also increased background through that region. And to compare these systems, you look at their LODs. Here's titaniums with uh, the signal to noise ratio and LODs for those spectra, and then for strontium. So it's easy to compare systems. The next slide shows three very similar systems. Each are 100 micron monocap systems. The only difference between these three is that the green trace was collected for 1,800 live seconds instead of 1,200. And calculated the LODs, and for titanium strontium, they're fairly similar from one system to another, as you would expect. A final reason to calculate signal to noise ratios is for QAQC checks. Uh, a couple different uh, ways you can go about it. In initial instrument or method validation, you can set up a signal to noise ratio target from a standard glass such as uh, SRM612, which has a variety of elements added to it at about 50 parts per million. And what is suggested here is make sure that your signal to noise ratio for each of those elements is at least 10. And that's to make sure that your instrument is able to detect all these and is able to um, is sufficient for forensic casework, and this is the level that we want to be at. A second check is your daily function verification check, which Christine mentioned earlier. The suggestion on this slide is an LOD target of titanium of no greater than 50 parts per million. So if you run your 1831 at the beginning of your run, all you need to do is calculate the signal to noise ratio for titanium and make sure it's at least 6.8. And that ensures that for semi-quantitative comparisons that you conduct, it is um, reaching good limits of detection. Here's the example of uh, standard reference material 612, which has that variety of elements added. And just a comparison, the top spectrum is, was collected for 1,200 live seconds, the bottom for 20,000. And just by increasing the collection time, you greatly, you can easily increase your signal to noise ratio. And so at the 1,200, the signal to noise ratio was 8.9. And so if I would have collected for 1,500 or 2,000 live seconds, I would have most likely hit the signal to noise ratio of 10, and that's what I could have used for, as my starting, uh, my initial instrument method parameters. So just to review the usefulness of signal to noise ratios for XRF, it helps you to uh, decide on peak labels and the decision of when to use those elements in semi-quant ratios. You can calculate limits of detection and compare those limits to other systems. And for QAQC checks, you meet LOD or SNR thresholds. So those are some of the reasons why you, would, you may want to calculate signal to noise ratios. Uh, here's how those ratios are calculated. And just so you don't uh, worry, I have a spreadsheet set up where it's a cut and paste into that. And within a matter of seconds, you get all the signal to noise ratios for that spectrum, for, for each element in that spectrum. So it's not a tedious, hands-on process. But here's what the software is doing. Here's 1831, and I'm just going to use strontium in, as an example, so expand to that region. The first thing you want to do is identify the channels of interest. Next, you define the baseline that separates the signal from the background. And finally, you perform your calculations. The total counts, which hopefully your software can give you through those channels, and then the background counts, it's a fairly easy uh, calculation to perform there. The signal is the total minus the background, and the noise is the square root of the, those background counts. So you're able to calculate the signal to noise ratio for this peak is 36. Just 
calculated it for other elements across the spectrum, just as a demonstration. And that's how easy it was to, to do that. I put it into the software and uh, I got all of these in a matter of seconds. These are the references, the foundational works that I used for this topic. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my employer, the Michigan State Police, for getting, giving me the time to conduct this research and also to come down here to present it. All of the EAWG members um, who helped me quite a bit through this whole process to figure out what I needed to be up here telling you guys, and the NIJ grant that funded that effort. Thank you for your time and attention.